Welcome everyone. This is hosted by the Baptist Studies Center here at Abilene Christian University. I'm here today with Dr. Lewis Brogdon coming to us from the Baptist Seminary of Kentucky. Uh, we are going to be talking about the Bible and justice today. So Dr. Brogdon, I am thrilled to have you with us. Uh, known a number of your colleagues for several years and delighted to have you with us. Dr. Brogdon is a public intellectual and sought out national speaker who serves as the Associate Professor of Preaching and Black Church Studies and Executive Director of the Institute for Black Church Studies at the Baptist Seminary of Kentucky. He trained at Bluefield College and Louisville Presbyterian Theological Seminary, getting his PhD at Regent University, um, and has served in numerous positions at Simmons College, where BSK is located, as well as Claflin University, Bluefield University, and Louisville Presbyterian. Dr. Brogdon is an accomplished writer with a number of books. I'm sure that some of them will be talking about the content of some of these as we're going. Um, he has the Bible in the Ashes of Social Chaos, an introduction to problematic text, as well as his companion to Philemon. He has written on Black preaching. He has written on Pentecostalism. He has written on... Uh, hope and prosperity gospel and nihilism and did i even see that you wrote the introduction wrote the foreword to a book on kobe bryant was that was that you okay yep i thought that that was you as well all right so <laughs> a prolific writer so today uh uh we're going to be talking about this intersection of scripture and justice so dr brogdon real quick i'm gonna i'm gonna turn it over to you but Tell us how you first got interested in this intersection of scripture and justice. What was that journey like for you? Well, I, I, it's important to, first I wanna say uh, thank you for the, the, the invitation and the opportunity to uh, be in conversation with uh, our sisters and brothers here in the uh, Abilene uh, University community around a very, very important topic as the, uh, this topic of the Bible as it intersects with justice. It, it was a journey for me. Uh, I grew up, uh, both my parents were ministers. I grew up in the church. I was playing drums in church at the age of five. Uh, and I think around the age of seven, my parents called me down to the living room and uh, and told me that uh, God had great things for me and that they wanted to anoint me. I didn't know what in the world that meant. Uh, but as serious as they were looking, I knew it was something important. <laughs> and God just had this path for me. Uh, it was in seminary hearing a uh, you know, I've been a, a pastor for a decade in uh, Church of God in Christ, but it was in seminary when I heard a lecture on the Bible and slavery uh, that it was almost a calling. Uh, mm. I've been pastoring for a decade, preaching. I'd read through the Bible multiple times and never paid attention to just how pervasive the language of slaves was in the Bible and how it intersect with um, with the history of Black people in this country. And so uh that started about a 10 year journey of really grappling with uh, some of those complex issues, complex issues of, of the Bible as it intersects with a major, major human rights issue, not only today, but 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 in history. Uh, and that's what got me into uh, into black studies and paying attention to the issue of justice, because then when you study how the church responded to slavery, you see that there were a small group of Christians who were on the right side of history who brought a critical lens to how you interpret scripture. And then you, you have a whole bunch of Christians who were on the wrong side of history uh, and using the Bible to prop up uh, problematic social institutions. And so uh, it was almost like a call, which path are you going, going to take son? Because uh, I was on the path of being on the wrong side of history, not looking at uh, human rights issues, social issues, uh, or am I going to learn how to interpret the text and to see the gospel in its context uh, and follow this path? And so, uh, I'm so I'm so thankful. I, I I do understand when Paul would make those references that Paul the he, when he would say he felt like he was the least of the saints because he persecuted the Christians that he wasn't worthy to be called an apostle. I know exactly what that's called because I get to speak in wonderful venues all over the country and, and all over the world, uh, and I don't deserve to, uh, but I'm very, very thankful that God gives me these opportunities. Amen. I'm going to turn it, I'm going to, I'm going to turn it over to you and make you the host so that you can share with us, um, share with us your work. Yeah, all right. 
All right, here we go. And, and while I'm pulling up, you can throw out the first question uh, and then I'll just hit the ground running. All right. Because I think everyone can see my, my screen. Mm -hmm. All right, so tell us, what are some of the major blocks for readers being able to see the social dynamics that are often in play in scripture? Well, to me, you know, I love going back to two big words in the uh, New Testament, uh, and those words are righteousness and repentance. And a lot of times when it comes to the word repentance, we do think of that as an appropriate way to respond to the gospel. We, but we don't always think of, uh, of righteousness. But righteousness really forms this sort of underlying narrative throughout the writings of the New Testament, and particularly what Jesus taught, that Jesus taught God's kingdom and that in God's kingdom, righteousness is the order of the day. And so the way to respond to God's kingdom it requires this, this change and this, this, this turning away from uh, whether we're talking enslavement to sin, conformity to the world. So I've tried to take up biblical and religious scholarship with this, with a guiding vision uh, toward justice. And what's brought me to doing this work is the realization that all of this is contextual and, and, and responsive. That there's a lot of things that's going, going on around us. And God is always asking us the question of, you know, how we're going to respond. Now, if you were, were to study the prophetic formulas, look at, you know, the beginning of the book of Amos, the beginning of the book of, of Hosea, and in the very, very specific ways they would explain that the word of the Lord came to them uh, under the reign of a particular king uh, a specific year before a flood or earthquake. I mean, I mean, it was very, there was some specificity. So in other words, God, God's word, God's work is for a, a, a specific time. And so it was incumbent on me to, to then do some work to discern the times in which we find ourselves and so this, some of this here is just a part of a current book project that I'm writing on called uh, The Gospel Beyond the Grave Toward a Black Theology of Hope. Uh, we're in a historical moment. We're in, we're in the, a moment where uh, we're in a period where there is a, a moral reckoning happening all the way around us. And we see that our sisters and brothers uh, in, in white churches have a very, very problematic history, D dividing denominations by race, or when they would say, well, Black people can be uh, in our denomination, they would establish, you know, their own separate Negro division. Never this willingness to share the worship space with our sisters and brothers in the Black community. Uh, history will show you Plenty of evidence of giving moral and theological support for things, slavery, segregation, uh, even based on, you know, friendships and love are, you know, must follow these strict lines of race. Well, this problematic history is connected to what, you know, I found to be a deeply problematic theology. For example, uh, Many of our sisters and brothers in, in the white church, they don't really interrogate how whiteness functions in America. Okay, so one of the most fundamental things we do as Christians is called the Eucharist, or uh, in uh, some churches, we call it the Lord's Supper. First Corinthians 11 tells us we must examine ourselves. So like the, the self-examination in relation to our sisters and brothers in the body of Christ, that, that's, that's fundamental. But, but when it comes to whiteness, it's like we, we can't do that. Um, so there is this history of, of hundreds of years of folks not being able to kind of interrogate all of these things that are going on around us. And particularly when it gets to that bubble on my far right and your left, 
refusing to use the Bible to, to correct these things under, you know, the excuse, well, we're not supposed to talk about uh, social issues. Well, what you're left with is a version of Christianity that, that says, well, you can be saved and then participating in things like racism. You can be saved holding on to your privilege. Uh, you don't have any responsibility to systems of oppression. You can ignore suffering. Uh, look the other way when there's white extremism walking up and down the streets, explain away while, you know, all of these, all the data on uh, racial inequities. But this version of Christianity is collapsing everywhere around us. Uh, and so in a sense, my scholarship is, is trying to give witness to the gospel amidst all of the fallenness uh, that, that surrounds us. And so that sort of frames, uh, you know, some of the work that I'm doing around the letters of Philemon that, that dives into some of these thorny complex issues around uh, the Bible uh, and the issue of slavery. I've done some work on Luke as it intersects with the issue of uh, racial privilege. We'll talk more about this. And then my new book on the Bible and the Ashes of Social Chaos that then provides an, an invitation and an opportunity to think about what do you do with some of the problematic parts of the Bible in relationship to um, the theological whole of the Bible that's so very important uh, to the church. So that, I just wanted to share a, a couple slides so I can have, have, have a, a few little teaching moments before we kind of engage in conversation. And I will, you can take the host privileges back and I'm, we can just chop it up the rest of the way. Oh, you're still muted. I want to ask you about your book on Philemon in particular. I, I really enjoyed it. Um, you have this really, this, this great way. And I think Philemon is like a, a perfect test case here for how we read scripture in light of contemporary dynamics that are very, that that seem to have been something that wouldn't have been as problematic in a previous age which we now recognize to be like deeply a, deeply a problem right um yep. how do you go about how do you walk us through like how how would you take a book like Philemon and talk about what the like what are the dynamics here how do we make sense of the message of the gospel as Paul is unpacking it here how do we how do we how do we read a book like Philemon? Well, you know, I I, I do want to thank you for you know having having a platform, you know, for us to even talk about a book that's in our canon. That uh, you know, I, I describe in the book that the letter to Philemon is a book that just lies in canonical uh, obscurity. Nobody talks about this letter. They don't preach from it. It's almost as if this letter doesn't exist. And it's, but it's, it's in the canon of scripture. If you know anything about uh, the, the the black church, it's a, it's a deep engagement with the Bible. Uh, black preachers can find almost any angle for a sermon out of any text. But in all of my years in the black church, I have never heard a single sermon uh, from from the book of Philemon. In fact, I just backed into <laughs> doing this work on Philemon because in my master's thesis, I was really focusing on Ephesians and Colossians, okay? And it was my New Testament professor that says, you know, you need to, you know, look at Philemon as well. So I was like, okay, I'll, I'll throw that in as well. Uh, but I was, you know, focused on the heavy text, you know, Ephesians. Mm -hmm. But when I learned about the history of this text, that this, this text has a very, very problematic history for Black people, that this was one of the texts the pro-slavery camp kept appealing to when they were trying to justify slavery from the Bible. Uh, they kept going back to an interpretation of this letter that what Paul was doing was sending back a thieving, no good for nothing, runaway slave, who's now is going to be a good slave because the slave is now a Christian. 
And he's sending him back to his good Christian master and saying, you know, treat him nice. Treat, treat him like a brother, not just, not just a slave. Now, that interpretation actually led to laws being passed in this country, like the Fugitive Slave Act, that made it illegal for Africans to try to run away. Uh, and so many times, you know, if they would try to run away after the passing of the law connected to the interpretation of a, of a particular text, they could be beaten, sometimes killed. Uh, so, so, so talk about a very, very problematic history. When I start learning about the history, I'm like, why is this book in the canon? Uh, and I come to find out that the original reasons the book was included in the canon have nothing to do with this slave flight hypothesis and slave flight interpretation that there was actually something subversive and radical going on in this letter that I think has has significant implications for uh, the work that God is calling us to uh, in the church. To me, the biggest issue in the letter to Philemon is why this enslaved person named Onesimus was living in the house of this Christian master, but was not a Christian himself. Okay, so to me, that's the elephant in the room. All right, now, why did Onesimus come to faith in a cold prison in Rome with Paul and not in the house of this Christian master? Well, when you study the literature of enslaved persons, they will tell you that Christian masters have, have they have this duplicity that they can be a bit two-faced, that they can be very, very uh, kind, compassionate to people they see as their social peers. But then people who they don't see as their social peers, they can be abusive, uh, demeaning, dehumanizing. It's okay to exploit these people. To not think that those dynamics could be in play in the letter to Philemon, uh, I think it w w was pretty revealing. And for those of us who come from like evangelical type traditions, we care about people's souls getting saved. Well, how Onesimus was being treated was impeding his uh, possibility to, uh, to, to experience uh, the, the, the power of the gospel. But of all places, you, you see this miracle happening in the letter, and it, and it happens in, in human history. It happened even among our ancestors that even though the Christian religion was being misrepresented by Philemon, misrepresented by many white Christians, you see millions of black people in America uh, experiencing the God that was being misrepresented. So uh, the, the gospel is, is very, very powerful and very, very radical. And so what Paul was doing was trying, was calling this church out, but having to do it in a very, very diplomatic way because the person who was the most vulnerable was the one delivering the letter, a letter that was publicly being read in the church. So he had to, he had to be mildly suggestive and, 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 uh, and, and shrewd in, in the rebukes. But, uh, but shrewd and radical nonetheless. And so I think Paul was advocating for Onesimus uh, wanted Onesimus to be set free. And in the early church, this letter was included in the canon because some of the church fathers believed Onesimus was actually the one who collected Paul's letters. Uh, and when they started debating which letter should be included in the canon, and they kept studying the lists and all the lists of Paul's letters. You would see, you know, the Corinthian letters, Romans, Ephesians, Colossians, Philemon, all of them, you know, Timothy, Titus, that they believe that that was Onesimus, uh, and some church fathers argue that Onesimus was the first was the first bishop in Ephesus. So that's that's a pretty radical storyline. That's a that's wonderful. I had never. I have to confess that it, in all the times that I've read Philemon, it had never crossed my mind to ask the question that you asked. Um, why is why is why is uh, Onesimus have to go join Paul in prison to become a Christian? Just, yeah. Uh, yep. Uh, so in your in your commentary on Philemon, you argue for a reading that you call ex, uh, ex, 
you you talk about something called exclusionary koinonia, that this may be a dynamic that helps us to see what kind of justice that scripture has in mind. Do you, would you mind, like, what is that, what is that concept? You want, can you help us unpack that a little bit? Absolutely. I mean, the, the first Christians, they were all struggling with how radical the gospel uh, really is. In the uh, letter to the Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, you see that rich Christians were excluding poor Christians at the agape love feast. And Paul was mortified about this, really took this church to task, that, that Christians were still trying to live into how radical the gospel can be against this sort of a ten tendency to, to accommodate itself to cultural norms. Oh, well, rich people, we all eat together. We don't have a responsibility to, you know, to the poor. Paul was like, yes, you do. Uh, Peter would, you know, would start hanging around Gentile Christians until, you know, the folks in Jerusalem find out about it. Uh, and then, you know, Peter starts backing off uh, and Paul has to call him out on that. So exclusion is, is an issue a lot of the first century Christians were dealing with. And I think it's very much in play at the church here at Colossae that you have people who uh, are social peers and they know how to show koinonia, hospitality, fellowship amongst themselves. The problem is that they don't think that has any implications for people who are in a lower place uh, on, 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 the, on the social ladder. And so I think this is exactly what was in play here at this church that the enslaved person is watching Philemon interact with all the folks at the church and being all benevolent and kind and then treating the enslaved persons in a completely different light. Uh, and when you see this kind of duplicity up close in person, some people, some enslaved persons are going to look the other way. But I got a feeling Onesimus was kind of somebody who maybe called that out. Uh, and then, of course, then the master wants to come down on him and Onesimus has to get out of there. And he goes to Paul because Paul has been at that church. Everyone knows Paul uh, and lets Paul kind of know what's going on in this situation. And, I, and somehow the way Paul was interacting with him uh, must have been so, so, so powerful, life changing and liberating that that Onesimus comes to faith in that prison. Uh, and is willing to to to, to go back. Uh, so exclusion, exclusionary quantity is connected to verse six. That I think that's where Paul is making a mild rebuke that the problem in that church is 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 exclusion. So, Rick, can you can you point us to maybe some other places? Is this a is this a principle that you find throughout other places within Scripture that helps us to? maybe make sense of uh, passages that would be really difficult for us to render today. Uh, how does this principle of exclusionary koinonia help us to interpret scripture well, or to interpret scripture in a direction uh, toward justice? Well, I mean, I think I've, so I've given three examples of three different Christian communities, all struggling with the same issue, that, that, that the gospel has this radical import, that it's it's bigger than the cultural and social vision of the world. That God is calling us to, to a vision that, 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 that's bigger and better. Uh, and we sort of want this comfortable, convenient form of faith that allows us to uh, sort of improve ourselves in an unjust <laughs> kind of social system and, and don't challenge us to live into something that's good for everyone. So while I don't think you need every text to address those issues, there's enough mm. textual evidence to show this was a problem for, for first century Christians. Uh, and this is why the letter to Philemon is so important for the church today, because I think this is one of the church's biggest problems, that we do the exact same thing. This mm. is why our churches are segregated along the lines of race, class, gender. Uh, all the middle class folks go to church together. 
poor folks go to church together, black folks go to church together, white folks go to church together, and we're all supposed to go to heaven and be together. And then you have a lot of people looking at us saying, that doesn't make any sense. You all can't stand being around each other on earth, but yet you all want to go to this same place called uh, called heaven. And so it requires us to do some real, real hard work because there's a, a lot of anesthetists out in society. The church is producing mass atheism. Okay. And then we're trying to condemn the very folks for being atheists, even though we've misrepresented what the gospel stands for in the first place. So, so Philemon is one of those writings. It's some, it's some teeth in this letter uh, and it, and it bites. Uh, Every person that goes through the doors of the church, you 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 feel the bite of this letter because it is challenging us to live into the bigness uh, of God's vision. Mm. Um, what do we do? All right, so this is this is the follow up question then. So, what do we do with histories of interpretation that have shaped Christian communities for better or for worse in a different vision of justice than this? Like, what do what do we what do we do? So in your in your in your commentary on Philemon, you point to not only like really good examples of a history of interpretation, but you point to like some really pernicious and wicked interpretations of Philemon. What do we what do we do with like these? The problem is though that these histories aren't just kind of like text on their own, but that they have wound themselves into our imaginations and into our practices and into our the way in which we think of what it means to be the people of God. So where, what do we, how do we, how do we move forward then? Well, I'll, I'll say, you, you know, aside from my, my current students, you know, every person on this call, you should probably take my hermeneutics class uh, because <laughs> I, 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 I teach you that, and there's a long history of this where you will have uh, text that have been interpreted in, in, in problematic ways. Now, now, and we live in a historical moment where if somebody has a problem with the Bible, they'll, they just want to get rid of the whole Bible. See, you shouldn't believe any of the Bible. You shouldn't use the Bible. Don't trust Christians. But a lot of times, even what marginalized groups and peoples have done is they have engaged in what I call counterinterpretation. So all I'm doing is what my ancestors have did for hundreds of years. They'll look at a text and, and they'll look at how that text is being used. In postmodern interpretation, some refers to this as a, a hermeneutic of suspicion. It asks the question, who's benefiting from this normative uh, interpretation of this text? And, and then it says, well, maybe if, we see that this text is nothing but but serving a particular problematic social vision, then we, we need to counterinterpret. Now, I'll, I'll get to some texts that are just problematic in a completely different way here in a moment. But Philemon is not one of those writings in the Bible we need to throw away. I think there's a lot of evidence of, of hermeneutical malpractice and that there's actually some seeds for something that's that's life-giving, liberating, and challenging that's that's rooted uh, in, in the vision of the gospel. Uh, and, and so you counter-interpret, and then you try to interpret text in constructive ways that speak meaningfully into, uh, into the lives of people. And so that's what I'm trying to model in the, the Philemon commentary is sometimes you've got to tear down some things that have that 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 have a problematic history that aren't really rooted in the vision of the gospel but to then try to say well what is god saying uh in 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 this scripture and to try to discover uh, the, the the theological meat of the text and so i, I really really enjoy being able to grapple with the letter to philemon for years uh -huh. Well, you, you mentioned so you mentioned kind of that there might be other texts. So Philemon is one example where it seems like the good stuff is already there and it's just been misinterpreted. But maybe yeah. how do we how do we approach texts which would be of a different kind, like texts which seem to actively promote uh, things which we would take to be injustices, 
Yes. Like what, what sorts of strategies are there available to us in uh, in this way? Well, this gets into my, uh, my, my new book. It's called The Bible in the Ashes of Social Chaos and Interpretation to, to, to Problematic Text. You know, starting to try to wrap your head around just a tremendous amount of material that's in the Bible is it's very, very important to do because a lot, a lot of times we just we have this assumption that everything in the Bible is love God, love your neighbor, pray, live right, do good. Um, and while it's great to have that assumption, when you start actually reading the, the biblical text and reading stories, you find out there are other things in the Bible, things like yeah. killing people uh, and actually having prophets saying, here's what God says, kill these people, kill the men, kill the women, kill the children, kill all the animals. Wait a minute. I mean, I thought God created all. I, no, God wants them all dead. Uh, uh, babies' heads being dashed against the rocks, slaves obeying your masters. Uh, if you're a slave not trying to be free, these are all things you will find uh, uh, in the Bible. You have a text like in 1 Corinthians 11 saying that there's an order to creation. It's God. Uh, you, you then get to, to, to the man, and then under the man is, is the woman. Then you get some of these texts like in Ephesians, you know, wives being in submission to uh, to their husbands. So these are some of those texts. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and there there are many, many others that, that, that are very, very, very problematic. Sometimes it's just recording a problematic story. Sometimes it's actually prescribing you to do something that we're like, no, that, there's something wrong with that. Uh, women be women be silent in the church. Uh, uh, have have you have you heard Gina Stewart preach? I don't want her silent. Uh, my mother has been preaching for over you know fifty years. She is a she is a powerful powerful preacher. God uses her. So what do you do with a text like this? In the book, I try to help people to say you don't have to throw the Bible away. You can wrestle with the Bible. Um, and I talk about that no one uses everything in the Bible, even though they will claim every word of it is, is God's word. They're not even reading all of it. Uh, when they give you their statements of faith, they don't summarize the whole Bible. They identify those core texts, those central texts that they keep going back to that reflect the, uh, the, the, the deeper message of the Bible, the, the theological trajectory that they discern work that God started at creation that goes all the way to what we describe in Christian theology as the eschaton, the culmination of things, that God is up to something big. And we discern in certain texts which texts sort of represent this bigger vision. So I talk about in my book the importance of discerning the, the core message of the Bible. And discerning that core message is a way that, that then helps you to make sense of some of those problematic theological parts so that you can grapple with some of those texts. Sometimes counterinterpreting a text, another time saying, no, that's not the word of God. Slaves obey your masters is, doesn't carry the same moral and theological weight as doing justice, as loving your neighbor. Uh, killing the Amalekites, whether we're talking about the ancient Amalekites or whoever's the modern equivalent, that's not what God wants us doing. Okay, when God doesn't want us taking people's land like you see in, in Joshua. Okay, if, now you want to create a metaphor, well, land is a metaphor for your blessings, that's fine. But literally taking people's land and committing genocide, that's not the word of God. So learning how to be responsible, critical interpreters is very, very important. Well, everyone, if you have, as you have, as you're listening, I'd love for you to drop some questions into the chat. Um, I could, I could keep going. I've got, a, I've got a lot of questions, um, but I would love to hear from y'all. Uh, if you have questions about the relationship between scripture and justice, or you want Dr. Brogdon to follow up on anything that he's 
that he said so far, drop it in the chat and we'll we'll get to your questions. Um, so how do we connect the dots between scripture's vision of justice and our own practice? What does this mean for churches and their engagements in uh, social ethics or politics? Like, what is that? How do you how do you begin to move from like text to our context? You know, I like to remind my students all the time that we're not the first people to do this, that which is why we have to teach Christian history a little differently. I mean, a lot of times in theological studies, church history is like one of the most boring courses or the courses a lot of people dread. But if you have the right professors and the right methodology, you it's, it's actually one of the most important courses in theological studies because there are people who have done this work and they've, they've left this rich legacy for us to follow and for us to study and, and to learn for learn from. So one of my favorite courses uh, to teach here at BSK uh, is the, uh, the, the Life and Theology of Martin Luther King Jr. Here's an example of someone who is a Christian minister, a Christian leader, who's interpreting the Bible and standing in the Christian tradition in such a way that he leads a movement that actually changes the world. I mean, the, the world was a better place from the time, the period between when he was born and when he died. He left the world better off because of the way in which he lived. And the way in which he lived was deeply informed by the writings of the Bible and, and the Christian tradition. And so studying people like a, like a Dr. King is, is one of the ways we can learn practical ways to do some of this same work. Uh, in my writings, I, I try to encourage my students to pay attention to issues of human suffering. In Exodus 3, we see God telling Moses at the burning bush that he has heard the cries of his children. He has seen their suffering. Uh, and so the same God who, who saw the Israelite slaves suffering is the same God that, that is witnessing human suffering on profound levels today. And to not think that what it means to be a Christian, that Jesus did not die on the cross so that we can go to a church building. Like, so some of the collapse of American Christendom is really for good, is for good purposes because we've so missed it. We think Jesus died on the cross so we can all go to church. Instead of thinking about the implications of the death and resurrection of Jesus for the world and thinking of the work that we do in our churches in relationship to God's world, not making their church the world. So when congregations start thinking about God's world and taking up this work in God's world, then there's no escaping issues of injustice, justice, because they're coming out of issues of human suffering. It then means we have to think of preaching and ministry and how we interpret scripture. We have to think of them differently. Sorry, the sun is coming in. Uh, it's it's literally, it's almost like my version of the transfiguration. This is God's way of saying, <laughs> preach, Dr. Brogdon. I'm doing the best I can. <laughs> All right. So I got, a, got our first question. Uh, could you say a bit more about the print? Like, so... What are the principles and guidelines that allow us to make these uh, dis these discernments within Scripture about uh, that's not really the Bible, or this is the this is not something that is applicable for today, or that this is something? Are these principles that we're drawing from within Scripture itself, or are these principles that we 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 need to turn to some other source in order to be able to to make these determinations? How does that walk us through the process? It, it it happens in community. So I'm not mm. arguing for a model where you as an individual, you're sitting back like, okay, no, this verse, nah, no, nah, nah. Yes, mm -hmm. yes, no, no. When, when our churches, we have this history of things we call confessions and creeds. When you read confessions and creeds, it's basically Christians in community 
organizing themselves around certain core beliefs and, 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 and saying these core beliefs resonate with our vision of, uh, of the gospel, our vision of God's kingdom. And so discerning those life-giving versus those, you know, death-dealing verses in the Bible, that, that's something we do uh, in, in community. I would not have had literally the, the scales from my eyes to use uh, uh, a, a New Testament concept. I would not have had those scales removed from my eyes if it was not for uh, women biblical interpreters who started opening my eyes to some of the dynamics of, of, of patriarchy and sexism in the text. Now, when I was in an interpretive space where it was all men, we never, what's the problem? <laughs> okay, but once your interpretive community opens up and includes others, and it may include some folks you don't agree with, but you need an interpretive community that's bigger than you. This is why the church belongs to God. It's not ours. It's God's church. It's God's world. And so other interpreters start seeing things in the text that can open your eyes to problematic ways you used to interpret a text, your complicity in systems that are marginalizing other folks, and then being open to going all the way back to that first slide I showed you to. In God's kingdom, righteousness is the order of the day, and it does require us that we're going to have to pivot and change and go in, in, in different directions. This, this is what, what it means to, uh, to, to, to be a follower of Jesus. And so when, when we're discerning those texts, we're, we're doing that in a community. We're listening to people who are saying, hey, you know that story in, in Joshua that, that means so much to you all? Well, we're the Canaanites. We're the people that came in and got exterminated. In America, those are the Native Americans. And Christians aren't sensitized to our sisters and brothers in the Native American community because We've, we've, we've hermeneutically sided with the Israelites who go in and we get to wipe them out. But once we realize it's more complicated than that, that God is not just on our side, then it means we have to make some, make some shifts and some changes and some pivots. Another question coming in. Do you think it is necessary to develop a kind of creed or confession in response to the statement on social justice and the gospel that was created and signed by evangelical Christians? So this is a statement from, oh, oh gosh, this is a statement from like a three, four years ago, I think. A couple years ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. You, and all. yeah, yeah you know the one I'm talking Yeah. Yeah. Um, do you think that it would be necessary for Christians to develop kind of a counter statement to that? That's a great, great question. A part of me wants to say yes as a sort of working document, but there's another part of me that, that wants to say no, that I want to give almost no energy to, um, to white supremacist Christianity that's, that's, you know, that's really, really dying. And if you read accounts of, uh, of, of exorcisms in the uh, in, in, in some of the Gospels, you'll see that right before the demons are getting ready to leave, they're, they're shrieking and screaming. Huh. And so a lot of all of the chaos that has engulfed this nation is just really a last gasp is something that's already dying. Uh, and I almost want to give, uh, because to me, aspects of white conservative Christianity is nothing but the modern version of pro-slavery Christianity that, that fought to keep us enslaved. So they're, they're doing what they've always done. Uh, and so I like them being relegated to, to cultural obscurity and not giving them any, any energy because most of the population of the country has, has already recognized what it is uh, it's just, you know, we're we're trying to continue to found, find ways to salvage that when they're unwilling to 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 repent uh, and to change. And so 
Uh, so I'm a bit conflicted uh, on that. Sometimes ushering strong statements so that, that the people in the world know where we stand, I'm for it for them. But I have no interest in having conversations with, 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 with those folks. They're, 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 they're riding off into the sunset for good reason. <laughs> Yeah, the giving giving oxygen to a to a dying flame is not is not necessarily what you want to do. Hey, so tell us uh, who are some of the who are some of the the the, the figures who have, you have read that have been most influential for you. I know in your uh, your your book on Philemon, you mentioned you mentioned the work of uh, of Doctor Wimbush, but uh, who are some of the other figures that you would direct us to? as models for this interpretive practice who help us to read scripture in the direction of justice? What is, who are, who are some of those folks? Well, when I was, uh, you know, pursuing my PhD, I read every, every, everything a black scholar, a black biblical scholar ever did on Philemon. That's not a bunch of people, but still, I made sure I read every last one of them. So Alan Callahan, who mm -hmm. has done excellent, excellent work, he wrote a book called The Embassy of Onesimus. Now, he has a different interpretation than I have, but Callahan's work is excellent. He wrote a book also called The Talking Book that really chronicles the, the history of African-Americans with the Bible. Clarice Martin wrote a, a stellar, stellar uh, article on the letter to Philemon that's in the book called Stony the Road We Trod, edited by Kane Hope Felder. Uh, so Clarice Martin is, 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 is an important uh, conversation partner for, for me. And I also want to lift up the work of the president of Union Seminary, Brian Blunt, who's, uh, who wrote a commentary on uh, the book of Revelation. He's done a lot of work on cultural interpretation. Brad Braxton is a, is a dear friend of mine who has written on uh, the book of Galatians and African-American experience. But my dissertation supervisor was a, uh, was a womanist political theologian named Estrella Alexander. Uh, so she supervised my my dissertation, the parts that intersect with African American uh, religious thought, and uh, uh, Dr. Alexander is 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 a fantastic uh, theologian and, and and church leader and uh, a major major influence on my work. And I love Nanny Helen Burroughs to just lift up some historical people. Uh, her her advocacy for the black community as it intersects with the black church as it ought to be is an influence along with King and Frederick Douglass. Wonderful. I've dropped links to some of these. Oh, and let me and let me give yep. you one more. I've yep. had an opportunity to uh, when I got to work at Simmons uh, to work with Dr. Kevin Cosby, and I would say in my in my career. Uh, Jeremiah Wright and Kevin Cosby, and now, and now this has changed because he's, he's he just finished his PhD. But Jeremiah Wright and, and Kevin Cosby, they just had D men's. They did their D men's out at United in the '90s when that was the that was the place to be. They were some of the most vociferous readers I've ever met in my life, and I know like scholars all over the world. Uh, and so the work that Dr. Cosby has done to uh, you know, not only to lead a, an excellent church, but to then exercise leadership of an, of an HBCU is, you know, it, it's it's been one of the hallmarks of my career uh, to say that I actually got to work closely uh, with Dr. Cosby. Uh, I got to, I got to be the provost and and, and supervise Simmons uh, for a year and work very very closely with him. And I've been working with him uh, for many years. Dr. Cosby has a book that we we read in our Black and Womanist theology course called getting to the promised land talks about the issue of reparations so the next time i come we can talk about reparations let's do it i just dropped to uh, dr cosby's book here in the in the chat as well all right so dr brogdon closing any any kind of kind of culminating thoughts here if you're going to give us some direction on how we go forth and begin to not only read scripture in the direction of justice but begin to connect the dots between scripture and our current practice what are what are kind of the your your takeaway points here? What are we where do we go? Well, I do want to circle back around to you know, you know, some of the first comments that I made that you know we have to discern this historical moment that we are in. 
So every person that's a part of this uh, webinar this afternoon, you are called by God. And in God's sovereignty, in God's providence, God wanted you alive now, not 50 years, 70 years down the road, or not 100 years before. But why does God want you right here and right now? I think one of the reasons God, God wants you to be right here and right now is because God has called you to respond to what is going on in God's world, to, to listen to, to the suffering and the cries of people around you, and to be like the Samaritan in the story uh, in Luke chapter 10. Not Don't be like those religious folks that look and keep going, but be like that Samaritan who's willing to risk himself to care for someone else to think of your ministry, to think of your preaching, to think of how you engage with the biblical texts, to think about it as that Samaritan, as responding to people who the world has left for dead and forgotten about. In Matthew 25, Jesus is out there sleeping under bridges, begging for food. And I think God has called you to find ways to connect to that suffering to amplify, to not let our world ignore them. And then to say, how do we use our moral authority, our moral voice, our institutions, our resources to respond to that kind of suffering? We're not going to fix it. I wish we could fix this world. God, I wish we could fix this world. But we can respond. We can do something. That's right. And that's what I want to leave you with. I love it. Well, Dr. Brogdon, thank you so much for your time this afternoon. Uh, everyone who's on the call, thank you so much for attending today. Uh, thank you this all. This will be up on YouTube here in a, uh, shortly, and the link will be sent out afterwards. So, Dr. Brogdon, thank you for your time. I appreciate you, sir. You're very keep welcome. The, Have a wonderful keep day. Up, keep up the great work. Thank you.